Hello, hi, it is William Colling from Wee Wee Blogs. This is not a video I ever thought that I would be filming. This is not a video that I ever wanted to film. And it's certainly not a video that you guys ever wanted to watch. But in recent weeks, uncertainty, tension, and fear have really been rising all over Europe and the world amid the ongoing coronavirus outbreak. This pandemic has disrupted major events, but more importantly, it's disrupted people's lives. People have lost their lives. Friends and family are still coming to terms with that. And so for us to sit here and be worried about a music contest can actually seem kind of silly compared to the bigger problem. But because people are worried, because all of us love Eurovision so much and want to know what's going on, I thought we should have a little chat, just discuss where things stand now as far as we know and understand what we can glean from media, what people are saying, statements that have been issued. This isn't a fun video, and I don't particularly want to be doing it, but I think it's important to have an open and transparent discussion. Um, while we all wait to know what's going to happen, ultimately we all know how important music is in picking people's spirits up and helping people get through difficult times. And so I think with this ongoing crisis pandemic, Eurovision is more important than ever. We all really are in this together. And if Eurovision does happen, which would be an amazing outcome, it'll bring people together and hopefully it will give people a bit of relief. So let's discuss this. Just so you know, I'm filming this video on Saturday, March 14th. The coronavirus pandemic is changing by the minute. This is a very fluid situation. Governments are issuing new restrictions, travel bans, guidelines, etc. by the hour. So just remember, this may be out of date by the time you watch it. We're going to be discussing a lot of different topics in this video, so if you want to skip ahead because it's a very long video, just look down in the description. I'm listing all the topics there. Just so we're all on the same page, the coronavirus causes a disease called COVID-19. This is a respiratory disease, so it affects your breathing. The main symptoms are a deep cough, tiredness, fatigue, and a fever. Neither the coronavirus nor COVID-19 were known prior to the outbreak in Wuhan, China at the end of December in 2019. People were reporting a mystery illness and then people were reporting it was pneumonia and eventually they realized this was this novel virus. At the time I'm filming this video, there have been more than 150,000 cases around the world and nearly 6,000 deaths. However, we should also point out that there have been nearly 75,000 people who have recovered. The fact is, in 80% of cases, people just have mild to moderate symptoms. They often don't know they even have it. The people who need to worry are the elderly and people who have existing underlying conditions. This could be cancer, this could be a pre-existing respiratory issue, and other diseases. And while certainly we all need to be concerned and do our bit not to spread germs, the fact is the overwhelming majority of cases do not result in death. Of these over 150,000 cases, more than 80,000 of them were in China, and now China is only posting about 11 or 12 new cases a day, so it has slowed. It clearly is very possible for countries to overcome this crisis when they put measures in place. Now, in Eurovision 2020 host country, the Netherlands, there are only about 960 cases at the time that I'm filming this video, and you might say that's not very many. But the fact is, this disease, this virus, is very contagious. It spreads through droplets that are in our mouth and in our nose, so when people cough, when people sneeze, these droplets can end up on surfaces. People can touch the surfaces and they touch their eye and then they can get it. That's why so many countries, sports bodies, organizers have canceled major events. The NBA in the United States, after a player on the Utah Jazz tested positive, play was suspended for the season indefinitely. Major League Soccer in the United States, they have canceled their season. Here in Europe, the Premier League, La Liga, the top uh, league in Germany, Clubs, leagues are canceling their games because when you have large numbers of people all together, the odds of transmission go up significantly. Formula One postponed the Australian Grand Prix. The Vietnam F1 Grand Prix has been postponed. It's also impacting tennis, both the men's tour ATP, the women's tour, the WTA. They have suspended play for several weeks. 
artists are having to cancel their concerts all over the place. This is all in the name of public health. Yes, it's unfortunate that people can't attend these events, but ultimately you have to put public health first. Now that takes us to the issue of the Eurovision Song Contest. On Thursday, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, he issued new restrictions in order to help slow the spread of the disease, COVID-19. The chief one that people have been focused on is he banned events public gatherings of more than 100 people. He also encouraged universities to offer courses online and also football games from, you know, the amateur ranks all the way to the big ranks. They have been canceled for the rest of the month. Naturally, that shines a spotlight on the Eurovision Song Contest. These restrictions, however, end on March 31st. That's about five or six days before the Eurovision Song Contest stage is going to start being built inside the Ahoy Rotterdam. So at this point, you would say, okay, the restrictions are going to be lifted, so everything will be fine. However, this is a fluid situation. This is incredibly fluid. If the situation has not improved, he could and would clearly have to extend that ban to keep the public safe. Now, the European Broadcasting Union has been saying that it's monitoring the situation. Now, obviously, monitoring a situation isn't a yes, it isn't a no, and it gives them the necessary wiggle room to deal with what is a very unpredictable situation. The Netherlands put these restrictions in place because they want to slow the spread of the virus. If everyone gets the virus at once, that puts a lot of strain on the hospital system, on the medical system. So by having people self-isolate or stay out of crowds, you slow the spread of the disease, which allows the hospitals to cope with the numbers of people coming in, because hopefully fewer people will be coming in. After that announcement, the mayor of Rotterdam said, if Eurovision is going to be canceled, a decision needs to be made by April 5th or 6th. Again, this is the time when the stage for Eurovision 2020 is meant to be constructed inside the Rotterdam Ahoy. So clearly he doesn't want all of that expense, all of that, you know, effort to be put in if the event is going to be canceled. This is what he had to say when speaking with a local news station. The government's measures are in place at least until the end of March. This means that between the end of March and May 16, we still have seven weeks. For me, the final day to make a decision is the moment we start to build up the stage. At that moment, you have to clarify, will it take place or not? We have two options. The EBU and Dutch broadcaster Avro Tross can decide about organizing it or not. If their decision contradicts the medical advice that I get, and in my opinion, we have to cancel, then I have to take my responsibility, but it's too early for that now. After the mayor's words were disseminated in the press, the EBU was forced to issue its own statement. The next morning, they finally clarified that plans for Eurovision 2020 are proceeding. Eurovision 2020 has not yet been canceled. This is what they had to say. The EBU is closely monitoring the situation concerning the spread of the coronavirus and keeping abreast of the latest advice and guidelines from the World Health Organization and national health authorities. We are working closely with Dutch host broadcasters NPO, NOS, and Avrotros and the city of Rotterdam to explore different potential scenarios for the Eurovision Song Contest 2020. However, with two months to go until the three live shows on 12, 14, and 16 May, and a rapidly changing situation both in the Netherlands and the countries of the participating broadcasters, it is still too early to make any final decisions. With this in mind, we're continuing to work together as a team on preparations to host the 65th Eurovision Song Contest in Rotterdam. Now, as part of those plans, obviously they need countries to come and film their postcards. Unfortunately, we know of at least two countries who have not been able to fly out to the Netherlands to film those postcards because of health concerns. The first is Israel. Eden Alen's team have said that she would not fly to the Netherlands for the postcard shoot. And also Lithuania, the Roop, they decided not to fly to the Netherlands to film their postcard out of health concerns. The Roop also said that they were canceling all of their pre-party appearances. They would no longer be coming to London or the Netherlands because they need to stay at home so that they can be healthy for the Eurovision Song Contest in May should it proceed. Writing on Instagram, they shared a picture of the outfits they would have worn in their postcard shoot along with this message. Today we were supposed to fly to the Netherlands for filming, but health first. Here is a picture from the outfit fitting. We hope to use these crazy clothing combinations soon. 
The heads of delegation meeting in Rotterdam last week, that was impacted. A lot of countries did not show up. You know, Sweden, for instance, Israel. I know the two of these did not come because their governments advised against it. They joined remotely, as did several other countries. So clearly, state broadcasters are putting the health of their employees above the contest. And frankly, that's how it should be. The EBU has not been immune. They had someone test positive. After that, the general director had to institute a travel ban. So Jan Ola Sand and some other top officials from the Eurovision organization, they could not attend the HOD meeting either. Now, they were very quiet about all that, and they didn't want to make an official statement. Instead, they shared it with heads of delegations, and then obviously some heads of delegations shared it with their songwriters, and their songwriters shared it with other people, and it kind of leaked out. And I think maybe they just wanted to prevent fear. They didn't want people to be worried and scared. But I think what we're realizing now is that transparency is key, and that being open, being honest, actually puts people at ease because it shows them that you're handling the situation and taking the necessary steps to protect your staff and indeed viewers, fans, artists, etc. Of course, the road to Eurovision is filled with pre-parties, and unfortunately, two of the big ones have had to cancel. The first is Spain, the ES pre-party in Madrid. Spain has ordered citizens to stay at home as much as possible, and they're already closing schools, restaurants, bars. They're going into the isolation mode, and you cannot have a massive party public gathering when this type of thing is going on. It's unclear how long it will last. Israel has also had to cancel its event, Israel Calling. They had not yet announced it officially, but they were about to. They had already invited delegations, but unfortunately the situation is just too complicated. The country is obviously fighting the coronavirus. At the same time, there are strict quarantine measures that have been introduced by the government, so foreigners who fly into Israel have to prove that they can self-isolate for 14 days. It's, it's very difficult to organize an event when countries rightfully have to respond to their own government's guidelines, which are constantly changing, and also when different contestants and acts have different concerns about their own health, they may not want to travel abroad just before Eurovision because they don't want to risk getting ill themselves. Another big pre-party is the one here in London. Now, organizers have asked for patience while they try to figure out the situation. The UK is a bit of an oddity in that at the time of filming this video, we don't have any restrictions on our movement or on gatherings, but that could change very quickly. There is certainly a lot of political back and forth at the moment. Doctors don't agree with each other, advice is conflicting, and it is likely to change. So the organizers of the pre-party here in London their hands are somewhat tied. At the same time, if the government hasn't instituted a ban, the club Café de Paris may not want to give them a refund for their money. It's just such an incredibly difficult, stressful situation, and it makes it impossible for them to plan. Again, this is a fluid, evolving situation. Now, we need to go back to that statement from the EBU. If you read it, it says very clearly, they are working to explore different potential scenarios for the Eurovision Song Contest 2020. Now, in an ideal situation, that would be Eurovision with all the bells and whistles, the full audience inside Rotterdam Ahoy, the press events, the press room, the red carpet. But given the momentum of the virus, the current trajectory, the fact that medical experts are saying we're not going to reach our peak for several weeks, if not months, means that that's really unlikely. If we're realistic, that doesn't seem plausible. So they are rightfully looking at other scenarios of what could take place to make sure that this event happens. Now, one idea that's being floated around all over the place is having Eurovision without an audience. Now, obviously, this is upsetting for the artist, and you really have to feel for the artist if that actually happens, because they'll be playing to an empty room. Artists thrive on the energy. They draw their own energy from the crowd. You know, you love seeing the crowd on TV. It gives this, this sense of an Olympic event. However, it does seem like a fair compromise. If we cannot risk people giving each other coronavirus, then letting the artists sing anyway is still a beautiful thing. Look at Denmark recently. It wasn't ideal. They had to cancel their national selection audience, I think with just a day's notice. But the show went on, the music was great. Ultimately, this is a TV show. People watch Eurovision from home for the most part on television. They will be sympathetic to the fact that there's no audience. They're not going to slag off the show. The fact is, this is perhaps the easiest way to make sure the show can go ahead. And, and that should be the goal, is letting these artists showcase themselves to all of Europe and the world. 
we should point out that prior to leagues being cancelled, a lot of football clubs, including those in Ligue 1 and La Liga, did play with no crowd. So there's precedent for this. Having no audience would also imply crowd reductions elsewhere. You'd also have to think about getting rid of the red carpet. You can't have artists rubbing up against strangers, taking selfies just days before the grand final and semifinals. They could get very ill. You'd have to rethink Euro Club, you know, a sweaty venue where people are dancing, drinking. There's not a meter of space between people. Eurovision Village, again, massive crowds. You may even extend that, and I hate to say this, to to the press center, which is also quite crowded often, Eurovision attracts crowds and all of these spaces could be impacted and indeed should be impacted if you're following World Health Organization recommendations. You would also think it's reasonable then to thin the delegations. Well, obviously the essential dancers, the singer, the head of delegation need to be there. Do you really need everyone else? Perhaps you can share makeup artists. Perhaps you don't need the extended family back there. It's unfortunate, but you're gonna have to cut numbers of people. And that seems like another place where you could do it. Now, obviously, all Eurovision artists want to have that moment in front of the people. However, there are still 200 million people watching. So while this is not ideal, it's still giving them exposure and it's still letting them share their music. Another option that has apparently been floated as a plan B is to have singers perform their act at a home studio in their country rather than in Rotterdam. This emerged today, you can read about this on Wooly Blogs, but the director of Slovenian television, that's RTV SLO, said that this was an option. Let me read you what she says. At the EBU, they are preparing as if Eurovision will still be held. I am personally in touch with the management who has a plan B, which suggests that we, national broadcasters, will become more involved. In Slovenia, this is supposed to be in the studio. If this scenario were to be fulfilled, each member would play their recording of the performance, then probably someone hosting in Rotterdam would link it. That's what they're thinking. They are still discussing everything, but in principle, they are still acting as if Eurovision will be held in Rotterdam. Now, fans have been really critical of this option for several reasons. I think the biggest one is that it's an unlevel playing field. One of the reasons so many countries hold Eurovision in such high esteem is that they could never afford to put on this type of production on their own. But by pooling the resources of 40 plus countries, they're able to have this amazing show that is the same for everyone. All the artists have access to the same stage, the same lights, etc. Now, if you have a competition where Latvia has to perform its act in its studio in Riga, and then, I don't know, Russia with its big studios, or Sweden with its big arenas, the technology they have at their disposal, it's just not fair. I've been to countless national selections. Moldova has very little in that TV studio. They make great TV there, but it's not fair to say the studio in Chisinau is the same as what can be offered in Friends Arena in Stockholm. It's just madness. This option seems to be in place in case it's too dangerous for people to travel. If the coronavirus goes even more loopy and haywire, then having people stay at home would be the safe option, and we have to put public health first, but it definitely creates an unlevel playing field that a lot of fans are not happy about. We already have a sense of how some broadcasters would react. You may remember back in 2017 when Ukraine banned the Russian singer Julia Samoylova from entering Ukraine to go to Eurovision, and the EBU, as a workaround, they proposed that Julia Samoylova perform in a studio or arena in Russia, and that be broadcast in to the show in Kiev. Russia was having none of it. At the time, they said this, we feel that it's a strange offer, remote participation, and that it contradicts the very meaning of the event. The only example I can think of of a performance being beamed in like that under unusual circumstances would be Amy Winehouse at the Grammy Awards like a decade or more ago. If you recall, she had been in rehab for cocaine addiction and then she was denied a visa to perform at the Grammys in the United States at the last minute. And so she performed remotely from London and she ended up winning Grammy Awards that night. So it kind of had a happy ending. But that was obviously under a cloud of all sorts of intrigue and stigma. And so, yeah, it doesn't sit so comfortably in this analysis. We need to remember that NPO, the host broadcaster, obviously they want Eurovision to take place. They have sunk so many resources, so much time, and so much passion 
into this project, it's been said that they cannot stomach the idea of not having an audience, but ultimately they have to respond to what the government says. At the end of the day, everyone's hands are somewhat tied because the Dutch government has the final authority. They are the lawmakers. They set the rules. And there are probably a lot of discussions taking place behind the scenes right now, but we're not going to get an answer until much closer to the show when they can assess the situation with coronavirus. Another comment we're seeing very frequently on Weebly Blogs is one of postponing. Can you just postpone Eurovision? And this is incredibly complicated. First off, it's impractical to know when will you postpone it to. Sure, we say heat will kill the virus, it's more difficult for the virus to survive in the heat, but say you reschedule everything for August and the pandemic is still taking place. You've then sort of reallocated all these resources and expense to make it happen in August and it can't happen then because coronavirus is back or hasn't gone away. But beyond that, there are also many, many other considerations. Will the Ahoy be available? That venue is very popular. It's booked out months, if not years, in advance at times. So you can't just easily move it. Robin Gallagher, a Wooby blogger, she's done a lot of writing on this. And I actually just want to read her comments, which she posted on Wooby Blogs. This was her response to this suggestion. A lot of people are asking why the show can't be postponed to a later date, but it's not as simple as it sounds. It's not as easy as changing your coffee date with Devin from a Tuesday to a Thursday. Changing the date of Eurovision would essentially mean starting from scratch. They'd have to find a host city. Does Rotterdam have something else on? A host venue. Is Ahoy already booked out? They'd have to find production crew to work on the show. Do the usual ones have other work booked for the summer? And rehire the staging equipment, camera gear, lighting, etc. Have their suppliers booked it with other clients? And the 41 Eurovision acts would also have to be available. Do they have other commitments? And when would the show be broadcast? A lot of competing broadcasters already have their schedules full with the Olympic Games, if that goes ahead, and other sporting events. There is a lot to consider, which makes me think the EBU and host broadcasters will do everything they can to have some sort of show go out on the planned dates. Fingers crossed, thumbs held. Some people have also suggested maybe just delay the show by one year. But at that point, the songs have already expired. They, they no longer fit the rule because they would have been released before the September 1st cutoff date. At the same time, artists aren't going to want to sing a stale song. They release these songs, you know, with a contemporary vibe of the moment and trends will have moved on. Also, some artists may not want to commit to, you know, another year. They have to do promotion all year. They have to put their life on hold. Some obviously would be thrilled to do it, but others want to, you know, have this beautiful moment now and move on. So if it's not clear, this is a very complicated situation. It's incredibly fluid. And I think people aren't making a big decision because they can't. There's simply not enough information at this point because the virus keeps changing. From the moment the coronavirus outbreak started, there's been a lot of finger pointing, blaming, people posturing. I'm not just talking about Eurovision, I'm talking more generally. You know, there's been a lot of ugly comments in American media about the Chinese disease. There have been comments from the Chinese foreign ministry blaming American troops for visiting Wuhan last fall and perhaps spreading the virus. There have been ugly, ugly racist attacks on people of East Asian descent. Uh, people saying, oh, I don't want to get corona. It's just been a really ugly situation. And I really hope that in the Euro fandom, in Eurovision circles, we can keep all that ugliness at bay. In the Eurovision context, I think there'll be a lot of finger pointing. If this is canceled, people are going to blame, you know, the host broadcaster or the EBU. But you guys, every party involved in this, they want Eurovision to happen. But ultimately, they want it to happen in a safe way, in a way that protects both the artists, their delegations, and fans. There is no easy answer, and there will be people who feel like they lose, whether that's the city of Rotterdam, which has made massive investments, the individual countries who have put up money, the artists who have competed so hard to get here. So many people are going to lose fans who have booked hotels, who have saved money for months, you know, to be, afford, be able to afford to go. It's just devastating for everyone. And I hope we can all just breathe deep and realize that everyone wants this event to happen and everyone's working to find a solution so that it can happen in some form. And so regardless of what does happen, let's just hope that we can enjoy some form of show and, you know, through civility and through mutual support that we can all do it 
with, with good nature, a good attitude, and hopefully our health intact. I'm obviously feeling very, very bummed. We had planned so many surprise events <laughs> for Rotterdam. Obviously the Wee Wee Jam, it was going to be our biggest party ever. Um, and there were some other smaller satellite events we were also working on. And yeah, I feel really gutted that we're not going to get to do all that. Not because I want to just have a party, but because we love meeting all of you guys and we love having the artists and celebrating and just being together. But it's okay. We can, we can do that next year, if not this year. We can do it if they reschedule later in the year. But all of that will come back. Right now, what's important is that people just take care of themselves. It, you know, our lives, all of our lives, your life, the singer's lives, the delegation's lives, producer's lives, it all matters so much more than the contest. And I, I just hope you remember that, that your life has so much value and it's still going to have value with or without the Eurovision Song Contest. Ultimately, the greatest wealth is health. You have your life. You will be alive for the next Eurovision. You will be around to hear more music, to be looping things on Spotify. I was just playing Montaigne. Shout out to Athena Manouk and I was just reviewing your song, Little Big, we just reviewed you yesterday. It's really upsetting, but we can all get through this. And I just wanna say this, if Eurovision happens in an abridged form, if it's done remotely, if it's done with no audience, we are still gonna be covering it here on Weebly Blogs. We will still be talking about it. We know lots of other sites will also be talking about it and still sharing that passion. Because I think more than ever, we need to be supporting the artist and each other as we all kind of come to terms what's, with what's been a very difficult, explosive situation. Um, yeah, so look. I'm wishing you lots of love. Just stay safe. If you want to learn more about the facts of coronavirus and COVID-19, I recommend the World Health Organization website. They've got lots of myth busters, lots of factoids, lots of good information. I also read the New York Times live update blog on coronavirus, the BBC's live page on coronavirus. They're all fantastic resources. But if all of this news is causing you fear or anxiety, then please don't read it. Watch a movie, go on Netflix, look forward to the Will Ferrell Netflix movie. Just take your mind off of it. This is actually one of the World Health Organization tips. They say if all this news is causing you anxiety, please step away from it. Because you don't want to weaken your immune system by being stressed and also Sometimes it's good just to check out. As long as you're informed and educated, you know, take some time off, it's okay. I'm not gonna end this video like I normally do, but just sending you so much love and we'll see you later. Bye.